Welcome to this year 10 and year 11 language and structure analysis webinar. Now we have three key takeaways, three key learning aims. First of all, understanding the difference between language features and structure features. Secondly, how to analyze language. And finally, how to analyze structure. Now this is for a specific assignment, which is based on an extract from the Pearl by John Steinbeck. And it's this will be designed for you in order to attain at least a grade five, especially if you're having center assessed or teacher assessed grades. Now, first of all, let's think about the difference between language and structure. For this part of your exam, you'll be expected to be confident with subject terminology. Now, subject terminology for language is very much about words and sentences. So it's about word class, small parts of the sentence like preposition, in, out, on, connectives, however, verbs, adjectives and nouns, and then larger parts of the sentence, simple sentences, compound sentences, complex sentences, imperative sentences that tell you what to do, come here, interrogative sentences that ask a question, is it okay, and lists. But also this part about language and subject terminology, subject terminology for language is about figurative language. It's about metaphors, it's about oxymoron, personification and similes. It's about symbolism and pathetic fallacy. It's about connecting with emotions and pathos. And it's about the whole types of vocabulary that are being used, the semantic field. So those are small parts of the sentence, larger parts of the sentence and imagery and descriptive language. That is specific subject terminology for language. What about structure then? Well, in a structure question, you would never write about adjectives or verbs or similes or metaphors. It's just not relevant. Metaphors are about the shifts in the way that the story develops. It's about whose point of view is being given. It's about how the story moves in and narrows or widens. It's about how the story moves chronologically or in a non-chronological way, flashing back and flashing forwards. But it also is about the use of sentence structure. So you might talk about sentences in your structure question. So there is a crossover with language and with structure, you can talk about sentences, but with structure, you wouldn't talk about words, you talk about the shifts. One way of remembering structure features might be finches. So the F in finches starts, stands for flashback, flash forwards, and also foreshadowing or forewarning. So ways of looking forwards and backwards and giving hints that writers do. The I for finches is introducing tension where problems or difficulties or new characters and places are introduced to add tension or reveal important information. The end for Finch is about narrative perspective. So you have different ways of telling the story through a narrator who knows everything, omniscient, through a narrator who doesn't and has a particular opinion, intrusive, and maybe a narrator you can't quite trust, unreliable. The C for Finch is about contrasts. What differences do you see? What kind of juxtaposition or opposites are being used in order to tell and structure the story going from one uh, aspect that might be more positive to another aspect that might be more negative or different types of contrast. The H in Finches is about hearing, so dialogue and speech that really again changes perhaps the mood or gives information or reinforces something about a character. The E in Finches is echo, so what patterns do you have? What motifs that add mystery or enigma? And the S in Finches is for shifts, how it goes from outside to inside, from maybe um, thinking to action, how it goes from large crowds to specific people zooming in or widening out. And then the sentences that may be isolated or complicated 
or fragmented or repeated. So those are the aspects of structure. You shouldn't be writing about similes because that's figurative and descriptive language. You shouldn't be writing about adjectives or nouns and verbs. You're writing about finches. Now have a go at this task. Look at these 20 different types of features. Are they language features? So about words and sentences and imagery and description, or are they structure features about the beginning, the middle, the end, and the ways that stories are communicated and told? Or are they both? Are they structure and language because they're about sentences? So we have narrowing, onomatopoeia, clause, omniscient narrator, widening, referring back, foreshadowing, flashback, conceal, resolve, climax, complication, simile, verb, noun, adjective, adverb, fragmented sentence, question and imperative. So which of these are language, which of these are structure and which of them are both? Pause the seminar and have a go at the task. Well, I hope that you were able to complete the task and that your answers are accurate. So narrowing is structure, onomatopoeia is language and clause is both. Omniscient narrator is structure, widening, referring back, flashback and foreshadowing and concealing, resolving and climax and complication are structure. Simile, verb, noun, adjective, adverb are language and fragmented sentence, question and imperative are both because they're about sentences. Now let's look specifically at this extract from The Pearl. So it gives us a short introduction that The Pearl is by John, John Steinbeck, written in 1947, so it's 20th century fiction. And in the extract below, set in Mexico during the 1940s, a child named Coyotito has been stung by a scorpion. The child's father, a Mexican pearl diver named Kino, takes a child to the white European doctor who works in a nearby town. So there's a lot of information that you can glean and you can start thinking, right, how will the writer use language? Verbs and similes and metaphors, pathetic fallacy and symbolism to really show us the situation about the boy being stung and the white European um, doctor and the Mexican pearl diver. And how will you structure narrative perspective, flashback, flash forward, foreshadowing, dialogue? How will you structure to really show us the character and the setting? How will you structure to really interest us? So as you're reading, as I'm reading this for you, try and think and gather your impressions of it for language and structure. The scurrying crowd came at last to the big gate in the wall of the doctor's house. They came to hear and they could hear the splashing water and the singing of caged birds and the sweep of the long brooms on the flagstones. And they could smell the frying of good bacon from the doctor's house. Kino hesitated a moment. This doctor was not of his people. This doctor was of a race which had nearly, for nearly 400 years, beaten and starved and robbed and despised Kino's race and frightened it too. So that Kino came humbly to the door. And as always, when he came near one of this race, Kino felt weak and afraid and angry at the same time, rage and terror went together. He could kill the doctor more easily than he could talk to him, for all the doctor's race spoke to all of Kino's race as though they were simple animals. And as Kino raised his right hand to the iron ring locker on the gate, rage swelled in him and the pounding music of the enemy beat in his ears and his lips drew tight against his teeth. But his left hand reached to take off his hat. The iron ring pounded against the gate. Kino took off his hat and stood waiting. Coyotito moaned a little in Juana's arms and she spoke softly to him. The procession crowded close to see better and hear. For a moment, the big gate opened a few inches. Kino could see the green coolness of the garden and the little splashing fountain through the opening. The man who looked out at him was one of his own race. 
Kino spoke to him in the old language. The little one, my firstborn, has been poisoned by a scorpion, Kino said. He requires the skill of the healer. The gate closed a little and the servant refused to speak in the old language. A little moment, he said. I go to inform myself. And he closed the gate and slid the bolt home. The glaring sun threw the bunched shadows of the people blackly on a white wall. In his chamber, the doctor sat up in his high bed. He had on his dressing gown of red watered silk that had come from Paris, a little tight around the chest now as it was buttoned. On his lap was a silver tray with a silver chocolate pot and a tiny cup of eggshell china, so delicate that it looked silly as it filled his big hand, lifted it to his the tip with his tips of his thumb and forefinger spread out with other three fingers wide to get them out of the way. His eyes rested in puffy little hammocks of flesh and his mouth drooped with discontent. He was growing very stout and his voice was hoarse with the fat that pressed on his throat. Beside him on the bed was a small, sorry, beside him on the table was a small oriental gong and a bowl of cigarettes. The furnishings of the room were heavy and dark and glooming, but pictures were religious, even the large tinted photograph of his dead wife, who, if masses willed and paid for out of her own estate could do it, was in heaven. The doctor had once for a short time been a part of the great world and his whole subsequent life was memory and longing for France. That, he said, was civilised living by which he meant on a small income, he'd been able to keep a mistress and eat in restaurants. He poured his second cup of chocolate and crumbled a sweet biscuit into his fingers. The servant for the gate came to the open door and waited to be noticed. Yes, the doctor asked. It is a little Indian with a baby. He says a scorpion stung it. The doctor put his cup down gently before he let his anger rise. Have I nothing better to do than cure insect bites for little Indians? I'm a doctor, not a veterinary surgeon. Yes, master, said the servant. Has he any money? No, they never have money. I, I alone in the world, I'm supposed to work for nothing and I'm tired of it. See if he has any money. At the gate, the servant opened the door a trifle and looked out at the waiting people. And this time he spoke in the old language. Have you money to pay for the treatment? Now Kino reached into the secret place somewhere under his blanket. He brought out a paper folded many times, creased by crease, he unfolded it until at last there came to view eight small misshapen seed pearls as ugly and gray as little altars, ulcers flattened and almost valueless. The servant took the paper, closed the gate again, but this time he was not long. He opened the gate just wide enough to pass the paper back. The doctor has gone out, he said. He was called to a serious case and then he shut the gate quickly out of shame. For a long time, Kino stood in front of the gate with his wife beside him. Slowly, he put his hat on his head. Then, without warning, he struck the gate a crushing blow with his fist. He looked down in wonder at his split knuckles and at the blood that flowed down between his fingers. OK, that is the extract. Quite a long one, but important, I think, that we have read it together. Now, let's first of all look at your analysis question. You have to identify and explain language features in detail. So in a nutshell means you need to analyze the effects of the writer's language by using quotations and subject terminology. So you're looking closely at words, phrases, imagery, figurative language, descriptive techniques, and sentence forms. So three key features are, can you use methods? Can you talk about effects? And can you choose appropriate quotations? Now for the higher marks, as well as talking about the words, you need to talk about the connotations. 
what are connotations? Well, connotations are the ideas, the feelings and the symbolic meanings behind words. So you think, need to think about what is typically associated with words. So we have here an example of white. Typically, it's associated with goodness. It's associated with purity, enlightenment, excellence, that kind of thing. Also, what is it? What is the definition? Well, white means something that's neutral and clean. But what does it make you imagine? Well, it, it, we imagine cleanliness, something refreshing, something, some hope, individualism. But we also need to avoid taking something out of context. The language can't work alone. It's about words and phrases across the whole of the extract, that how they connect with each other to create the whole impression rather than just singing, singling out a word and thinking about connotations. So we need to think about the semantic field or the lexical set. That means looking at it as a whole. Let's look at this particular one. Think about the connotations of the scurrying crowd that came at last, the big gate of the, of the in the wall of the doctor's um, of the <laughs> of the doctor's house. We could hear the splashing water, the caged bird, the sweep of the, bro the broom, the smell of the good bacon from the doctor's house. So connotations of the scurrying crowd. It's almost that like they're they're rodents or animals. It's almost dehumanizing the crowd. The big gate. Perhaps this is a barrier. Again, this could be sig signaling inequality and injustice because we can see that race is very much an issue in this passage. The splashing water may be about cleanliness and refreshing and purity that they're expecting, and the singing bait cage birds actually is about entrapment and courage and bravery. That although they're trapped, they're being courageous. And the sweep of the long broom perhaps is about how cleaning is happening, but it's very distant. So perhaps this idea of the distant doctor who's, de who's desperate for cleanliness and purity, but actually he's all about injustice and dehumanizing. And we can get that or when we look at it all together. Now in the, your assessment, you're more like you're likely to have um, an extract a small part that you have to analyze language rather than looking at the whole thing for language. And for the highest marks, as well as looking at connotation, you also would look at themes and issues. So looking at this particular aspect, the doctor who for a short time was part of the great world, that he said was civilized living. So you might say something like these adjectives explore how temporary and superficial his happiness was because it was based on the pursuit of being great, but it was only for a short time, okay? Let's have a look at what you could say about this, this quotation. So you're going to pause the video. You're going to look at this quotation, think about what kind of language devices are used, but you're going to think about the connotations behind the language and also perhaps some of the themes and issues that are being looked at. Pause the webinar and have a go. OK, so you may well have said that the, the eyes rested in puffy hammocks of flesh and mouth drooping in discontent are adjectives, concrete nouns, verb and abstract noun. You might have talked about the fact that it shows the laziness of the rich, the fact that even though he's wealthy, it doesn't bring him satisfaction and about his swollen pride because he's an invader in Mexico. OK, now I want you to pause the video for longer and have a go at this question. How does the writer use language to suggest the doctor is wealthy and greedy? So here I've given you sentence stems to talk about the use of the concrete nouns and items like silk and silver and chocolate and china. And what do they infer about the connotations about this Paris that he's his um, dressing gown is from Paris, the fact that his He's being for his face and his body is being described with words like puffy and stout. How does that reinforce and and develop these ideas of greed and wealth? So pause the video and have a go. And once you've done that, you can use the mark scheme to work out whether you think that your answer is basic. So is it level one, partial level two, clear level three or detailed level four? So pause the video and then mark your work. OK, for the last part, we're going to have a look at structure. So as we've said earlier, structure features are very different from language features. And this question asks you to look at the appropriate features and techniques of structure, not language, using quotations and explaining 
about why this is used at specific contextualized points in the text. So you're kind of pinpointing and mapping what the writer is doing at the beginning and at the middle and the end and how it shifts and develops and how it keeps your interest. So remember you're thinking finches and you're not thinking about descriptive language, imagery or word class. A way of looking at this is point evidence and explain. So what's your point? Well, at the beginning, this is what the writer is using. What's the evidence? The evidence is that the writer is using these different aspects of the Finch's flashback, um, foreshadowing, dialogue, contrast motifs. And then what is this showing? What's the effect? Well, the writer's trying to create this at this point. The writer's trying to force us to remember or create a sense of outrage or make us puzzled or create a sense of frustration. So you're making your point, what's happening in the beginning, the middle and the end. You're using your evidence while well, this is being used with this quotation and then you're explaining the effects of point, evidence and explain. So let's talk a bit more about these, these this specific, that's Finch's again, this specific um, assignment and how you would get the higher marks. Well, you would talk about perspective and style as well as techniques. Perspective would be about first or second or third person omniscient narrator and then the style would be is it linear is it non-chronological is it parallel as well as looking at finches what about this particular text well it's using the omniscient third person because we see the crowd and what they hear and then we also know that the whole of the uh, for 300 years there's, there's been racial tension and racism that the doctor's race spoke to all of Kino's race as simple animals so this dehumanization so the narr narrator the narrative viewpoint is able to tell us what the crowd think what Kino feels the prejudice in Mexico Kino's feelings the doctor's thoughts it is able to look at everything an all-knowing narrator also use a dialogue when the doctor spits out to the servant, I'm a doctor, not a veterinary surgeon, that really at that point shows the injustice and hard heartedness. There's no compassion. A young boy may be dying from a scorpion wing, a, a scorpion sting, and the doctor has no remorse, compassion or pity in his heart. And that's really important to pinpoint through the dialogue. You also have this motif, the fact he mentions the veterinary being a veterinary surgeon, the fact that earlier they talk about how that race, the white race, treated the Mexicans as simple animals. You can see this motif of dehumanizing that runs through the structure of the piece. We also have this dual or parallel narrative that we have the gate and the chamber and the gate and the chamber, what is happening outside and inside and the shift from external to outside. We see the outsiders who have no help and the insider who's unwilling to use his medical expertise to relieve pain. And then we also have the contrast between what Kino thinks, he's hidden these hurt pearls in his secret place, and what we realize that they're ugly and gray and worthless. These pearls that he thinks are priceless will never pay for medical attention. And then we have the narrowing at the end. We've had the crowd, we've had the doctor, and now we have the narrowing to Kino's frustration. He realized that his child may die and he smashes his knuckles and he sees his own blood flowing. And the narrowing of the blood really perhaps again is foreshadowing the death of his child. So these are some of the structural techniques and devices that are used at, in the pearl. Now I want you to pause the webinar, have a go at answering this, right about the beginning, what kind of techniques are used and why, in the middle, what kind of techniques are used and why, and at the end, remember to use the terminology, quotations are right about the effect. And then again, assess your own work. Is it basic and simple? Is it partial and almost? Is it clear and consistent or is it detailed? Would you get a level one, two, three or four? Thank you for joining me in this webinar. I hope you this has helped you to really understand the differences between language and structure, how to analyze language, how to analyze structure, and how to get at least a grade five for your assessment. Thank you for joining me and join me next time.